Welcome to Neighborhood Bookstore, an author interview podcast. Each episode, we're going to take a used book off the shelf at a local used bookstore, and we're going to talk to the author about its creation. Today's guest is best-selling author James Grady. I always, uh, I always want, I always want to give you the best I got because you deserve that, you know. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your Neighborhood Bookstore podcast. I'm your host, Eric Harper. Our guest here today is James Grady, who is a best-selling and influential novelist. Uh, He has been published for decades. He has been published internationally. He was also an investigative journalist, which we may hear a little bit about today. Um, And it is just an honor to have you here, James. Thank you. It's a, it's an honor to be here with you and your listeners. It's hello out there. I'm glad I'm glad you're here. Perfect. Well, by way of introduction, um, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So you know, I was thinking about it, and there have been many authors throughout history who who wrote timeless stories, ones that really spoke to people and and still exist. But I think there have been far fewer authors who created a story structure that inspired authors who came afterwards. Um, You know, and I'm thinking Mary Shelley did that with Frankenstein. Uh, I'm thinking Ben Hecht did that with his screenplay for Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious, which has been made into many other spy thrillers since, you know, using the bones that Hecht wrote. Uh, Dashiell Hammett definitely did that with Red Harvest. And... I think that you did that with Six Days of the Condor because after that book came out, it became the template for I think every political thriller afterwards. Well, thank you. I I, I felt so lucky to see that influence begin to spread throughout our culture. I uh, it, it's it's a it, it's it's humbling to be able to say that out loud. Well, the reason why I bring that up is because um, today we're discussing your book, Steel Town, which is a crime thriller, okay? Right. And I mentioned some of those other authors, in particular Hammett, because um, having just reread Steel Town, it's your riff on Red Harvest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Red Harvest it was it not only started what we call noir, Worldwide, Mm -hmm. it was set in a lightly fictionalized version of Butte, Montana. I'm from Montana, and while I lived about 200 and some miles away from Butte, it it was the gravitational center of Montana culture and politics, really right up until 1972. Wow. Yeah, it uh, it was a town that we used to call them the Copper Jackets, and they were the the robber barons who Butte had at one time the richest hill on earth. They mined it all the way down to a mile deep uh, pit that is now correct. is now a toxic waste dump, slowly filling with water that oh, will eventually yeah. overrun. Uh, a small portion of that state. And it was there that that the labor movement uh, had its early battles. Uh, it was there that political corruption in the 20th century became a force that was adapting with the times. And it was there where Dashiell Hammett, when he was a Pinkerton working for the companies, was offered a murder contract for five thousand dollars. Think about this. This was about nineteen, uh, oh, early before the twenties. Five thousand dollars then. That would have been uh, today. What a hundred thousand dollars or so. Oh, I'm sure they offered Hammett this five thousand dollars to kill a IWW, which was the International Workers of the World. The, the left-wing union, uh, also called the Wobblies, by the way. Okay. Uh, he, Frank Little, an IWW organizer, had been sent to Butte to help 
organize the miners. Hammett was given the murder contract, turned it down, was incensed. And 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 him think realizing that people thought he might be that kind of guy was one reason he started devoting his life to fiction. And about a week after he turned down the murder contract, he was in the boarding house where Frank Little, who had a broken leg, was staying, and he saw five masked men drag Frank Little out of his room, chain him to the back of a car, drive that car down to Main Street in Butte, Montana, and lynch Frank L Little from a railroad trestle in the, th the middle of town. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that story. Well, I you know, and growing up in Montana, I didn't learn it either until I was really pretty much gone from the state. And then you wonder how many other things in our history, how many things uh, were we not taught? How many things that your listeners should have just been taught routinely that we never were? And it's it's one reason why I, I one reason I love podcasts like yours and people like your listeners is because they're constantly seeking to, to uncover, I don't want to say the, tr the, the the facts as much as the truths of, of their history. The facts, yes, but also the truths. And that's why one reason your podcast is dealing with a lot of authors like me is is important and why your your listeners should keep listening. Wow. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That story about Frank Little segues nicely into the book Steel Town, um, because not only is it your riff on Red Harvest, but you updated that story for present time. So like as I was reading it, there are parts of the book where the, ge the geography is easily identifiable as Youngstown, Ohio, easily identifiable as Butte, Montana, with the reference to the pit, and um, sort of like based on the way characters in the book talk about its location, um, it's identifiable with Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, Absolutely. And all of those places had issues with um, the economy. They had issues with uh, organized crime, um, a declining industry, labor movement. So I guess my question to you is, how did Steel Town come about? Well, without Youngstown's plight and woes and and the problems it faced in the early 1980s, Steel Town might not ever have been born. I was I was reading my Washington Post one day, and there, way buried in the middle of the newspaper, was a one paragraph story about a citizens group testifying to a really uh, obscure small Senate subcommittee about the plight of Youngstown, Ohio, where they were all from. And according to the testimony, that with the collapse of the steel industry in Youngstown, the only power left in the in the town were corrupt politicians and competing groups of organized crime. And one of this, this, this blew my mind. This should have been a front page story. And it was buried in the post and nobody I knew cared about it. I mean, there were 58 car bombings approximately in, in that year too, in Youngstown. In a single year. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I've always identified with, I, I, I come from a, we got out of the lower middle class into the middle class. So I, 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 I'm, I've always been a working man. I mean, and, and, and I've always, you know, you know, worked my way through college on a road crew. And it just, uh, the, the idea that, that a, a place that used to be considered a wonderful American example was undergoing all these problems. Somebody had to write about it. And after, I looked around and nobody was going to do it but me. And with, with the, the influence of Red Harvest and Blending Butte, Youngstown, uh, a little bit about Allentown, but I, don't, I didn't know Allentown as well. 
I uh, I came up with with Steeltown. I went and I went to Youngstown. I spent about uh, ooh, over a week in Youngstown, meeting with civic leaguers and citizens, and going to labor union meetings and getting taken around town. And I I remember at one point one of my guides took me to a neighborhood. I want to say near a river. That and, was probably near downtown and, and the Mahoning River because that's yeah. where the mills were. And, and they said, look up at the look up at the light poles. And there were all these in those days, really bulky old surveillance uh cameras. And they were all pointing at this, I think it was a four-story windows blocked up brick building. And, and they I said, What what? And he said, That's a casino. And it it's <laughs> it's one of the biggest casinos outside of vegas and i'm i that blew my mind and about five years later it took the fbi about five years later to raid that casino and and announce that it had been doing 10 million dollars a year worth of business i found it in a week you know <laughs> <laughs> it just it, it it sort of spoke to me about kind of a sad lack of attention um, being given to our heartland and our heartland cities. And I, that, 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 that's, that I wanted to use my fame and, and, and power to try and do a little bit to, to shine a spotlight on where I thought Americans should be looking. I see. That makes sense. It's interesting too, because, um, I mean, not only is um, the Youngstown area, you know, famous for organized crime to a lesser extent now, but certainly in its history, it was. Um, oh, there's a there's a character in your book named Johnny Max who yeah. could easily be um, Whitey Bulger or John Gotti. Right. And it's very interesting because people don't think of characters like that existing in the heartland, but they certainly do. Oh, and they they exist in in other towns besides Youngstown, um, and I, again, that's the that's the same idea. I wanted to be sure that people knew. I mean, I was a organized crime expert. I used to give lectures at uh, uh, like the Industrial Security Association of America, and uh, I taught. I I was a guest lecturer at the D.C. Police Academy, and you know, it just. Uh, there were so many, I don't want to say they were erroneous cliches about organized crime because the cliches were true, but they were small. You know, it wasn't just New York, Chicago, maybe Detroit, you know, it, no, it was 20, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was 25 major cities with just the, the, the Italian versions of organized crime. You throw in the black and the Russian and the, the for a while, emerging Jamaican groups. You know, it, their organized crime was a problem beyond any ethnicity, beyond any uh, geography. And I think it's important for us as citizens to know that so we can keep our kids and grandkids safe. Right. Well, I'm guessing some of our listeners have not read the book yet. Um, so maybe you can just sort of give us a quick overview. What is the the story of your novel, Steel Town? Well, there's there's actually, you know, the kind of hidden story that I'll that I'll I'll reveal at the end, but it is essentially about a man who goes by many names, but usually Jackson Kane. And he is hired by and many small American cities have this, the grand patriarch, the man who used to be the biggest, richest, most powerful man in town. And he's now in his 60s, a guy named uh, Kimmet. He's and his giant, they don't, they don't even call them detective agencies anymore. They're security companies are hired to come into a, a, this town called Steel Town uh and remove the corrupt police chief the crooked mayor and the major gangster in town so the the ruling elite old man can once again 
claim the town. And what we don't realize, even in, in, until all, as we're seeing all the machinations and political maneuvering and violence that's happening in the book, our hero, Jackson Kane, secretly grew up in Youngstown. And in a way, him insisting that his company give him this assignment and give it to him solo, as opposed to bringing in a whole cadre, is him trying to come to grips with his own childhood, his own growing up, his own birthplace. And it's uh, I, that's a reveal that that I, I give to your readers, but it doesn't come out in the book till really three quarters of the way through. And I think we all, as human beings, want to go back to our younger days and fix things. But we can't. Right. You know, we can maybe have a good impact on today, but yesterday's out of our grasp, except on how we view it. And he, that's one of the, the things that Jackson has to deal with. Uh, and of course, you know, it, it shows in he uh, he has to choose between two women. One of them, one of them, Beth, is like, you know, the, the classic uh, uh, well-achieved young woman in the 80s, you know, law school, fine family, good prospects, decent heart, politically com committed. And the other is the local beauty who grew up and married into the uh, the ruling family that hired Jackson. And, you know, she just, she did it. The, she She's in the marriage to survive. And she and Jackson know that They've got something between them that is very powerful. It is probably love, but what do can they do about it? And that that was there were just so many themes that kept boiling up for me. You know, any any good novel writes itself. There's a certain point where I'm doing little more than dictation from these voices in my head, telling me that you know, I, are you kidding? I wouldn't say that. You're going to look, write this down. And that's the moment when you know you've got a, a book worth writing and a book worth reading. It's amazing. I completely understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you uh, know, um, the, man, the man who calls himself Jackson Kane um, works for a company in Red Harvest, it would be the Continental Detective Agency. Right. Uh, Which or in National Hammett's Day, it would be the Pinkertons. But actually, right. the Pinkertons are a known entity, a public entity. Whereas the company that Jackson Kane, the man who calls himself Jackson Kane, works for, is almost unknown. Right. They, they seem like they do not advertise. So was that based on? A, a real type of corporation that you're you were aware of at the time or can you describe like a company that's contemporary that would stand sure. in? um well first of all before i wrote steel town my wife was a private investigator and so i became aware of what we're now calling euphemistically security and investigative companies uh, there was one that was, as far as I know, honest, called Kroll and Associates, running out of New York, that had about a, 150 official operatives. Uh, and there were about another, I want to say, at least eight or nine other major American companies that were like that. In Brit they are in Britain now, too. Uh, I think there's there's that group of of mercenaries um that we oh, have like black water black water yeah i mean imagine black water having an investigative arm and it's the same thing as the company that jackson kane works for um it, it it's private private security forces and police uh apparatus groups have a 
place in democracy, but not as big as the, they have in our in our democracy now. They they I would like to see them reined in. I would like to see. I would like to see our citizens, your your listeners, be able to trust the news they're getting, you know, thrown at them by their telephone and and be able to trust that um the the security that they're seeing in in their hometowns in in Youngstown and in Allentown and you know Butte Montana that it's there to help protect them and not just to protect the moneyed interests you know i uh, i i'm i'm a huge believer in free enterprise but i don't believe in uh, autocracy you know it's which is that's what that's what putin has you know he has a he has a country that is run by billionaires who have often as we just saw with the wagner group their own their own personal armies and they may talk about freedom and russian heritage and everything but they're they're under the same thumb they were under when they were the soviet union and calling themselves communists right and in your novel the man who calls himself jackson kane is one of those people working for one of those companies and he is inserted into a place like Youngstown, Ohio, you Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I noticed, because full disclosure, uh, I'm not from the area, but I am a, a full-time resident of Youngstown, Ohio now. Um, I didn't move to the area until after the era that your book is set in. Um, but I'm certainly familiar with its history. Um, because for one thing, uh, people in Youngstown love to discuss their history. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. It's, even even when people in Youngstown are telling or were telling me about a horrible thing, there was civic pride and there was and there was a love of, you know, this is where I grew up. This is where I, I, I have a family. This is where I'm making my stand to live the best life I can. I, I was that's that was one of the things I loved about Youngstown is that it was in the midst of all the violence and some despair, there was just this river of hope that, that I, you know, I, 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 it made me smile the whole time I was there. That's very cool. And my, my, my copy of Steel Town is a used copy, um, which I picked up in a used bookstore in Youngstown called Dorian Books. And this was probably 12 years ago now um and poignantly after i i bought my copy of the book uh dorian books closed and it was oh. the last used bookstore in in youngstown uh until about a year ago when um a new used bookstore opened up it's called pop art books culture it's actually owned by uh my friend craig duster who occasionally co-hosts the podcast with me um, but I wanted to talk to you one-on-one -on -one today because I wanted to mention Dorian Books. So I bought Steel Town, um, which is, I have to say, as hard-boiled and bleak a novel as I've ever read. Oh, I, I yeah. Yeah. And I think um, appropriately, when I opened it up, the, the pages had cigarette ashes in them. Really? I <laughs> loved I They I'm did. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a section of the book when um, one of your local characters is is describing Steel Town and sort of gives a litany of places that it's like. And they say, it could be Youngstown, Ohio, or Allentown, or Butte. And my copy actually has the phrase, it could be Youngstown, underlined. So wow. someone from Youngstown very much responded to your book. Wow. that I'm sorry. That makes me feel really good. Yeah, and... so it was well-loved. You know, yeah. Well, you know, to that to that degree too. Like there are, even though the book has clear references to places like Butte, Montana, because Steel Town has its version of the Berkeley Pit and so forth. Um, there are so many things in your book that are very obviously references to Youngstown. Um, there is a an, an illegal lottery 
called the bug, bug. which everyone is into. Um, there's a section where your corrupt police chief is talking about a new trend of citizens ignoring traffic lights yep. as a sign of the decline of the area, which I've myself witnessed while living here. Um, there's There are characters that I, I could imagine could be a veiled reference to people like Congressman Jim Traficant, who was a sheriff before oh. he went to Washington. So I guess without putting you on the spot, to what degree is your book a Roman a clef? Well, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's, that's, that's an interesting question because yes, I tried to hew it as close to uh, the realities of Youngstown and Butte and Allentown, a couple other places. Um, you have to, you have to fictionalize for every re uh, for reasons including libel you know i mean <laughs> oh, yes. i didn't i did not want to end up yeah you know but uh it is like i said to me i wasn't just writing a thriller i was writing a muck raking i want to call it even an expose of of the plight so many Americans were facing in the early 1980s okay. uh, with with the complete turnover of our industrial apparatus in this country. And so I felt like a lot of the things that 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 people would tell me, oh, that's just, you know, wow, where did you make that up from? And I said, no, that happened. <laughs> you know, that, that really happened. It's just, right. it's just, you know, and and they, they they you get a comment back or a look like really, and you you, you know you just have to you just move on and say well you know you learn from the fiction what you can I mean and you're right I I would argue it is indeed a Romana clef okay. it, um, it is it is and it's seventy percent Youngstown. Yeah, uh, that seems fair. Yeah, that was that was sort of the vibe that I picked up while reading it. But in fairness, you know, it it, it the book looks at things that were happening and are happening in Detroit and many oh. other places. Oh yeah, you know. Oh yeah. The, the amazing thing is that the metaphor that the media has picked up on about Youngstown applies to many American cities who are Absolutely. in industrial decline. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it just we didn't we didn't really as a as a as a political or cultural entity ad address those issues directly and we luckily economically shifted somehow so those forces were not as apparent they didn't win now that doesn't mean they lost but it 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 means that we, we we actually drove past the car wreck without looking and seeing the horrors uh, that were there. As a culture, people in Youngstown knew, people in Butte knew, people in Allentown knew, people in people like the great American author of my generation, Bruce Springsteen knew. You know, it's just it's just. I want to. I, I. I. I am sort of very glad that that Steel Town did not become the model of how we 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 ended up, because I don't want to see that many people suffering. Right. Well, and like especially because it's a it's a very dark take on that scenario. Um, yeah. But also, honestly, uh, I was I was shocked by how prescient this book is. That issues that are brought up from the 1980s are still ones that we're facing now. There's a, a section of the book where uh, the man who calls himself Jackson Kane unearths that the, the, the biggest local bank is actually secretly in financial trouble. And the commission yeah. that he's working with determines that if that goes public, that bank is going to need um, a government bailout, which is exactly the type of thing that we've seen in this in this decade, never mind this century. Right. Um, there's a, a subplot with a character trying to bring in a Japanese automaker 
to replace the lost industry in Steeltown. And that was certainly something that was true in the 1980s. But it's equally true now um, as uh, startup electric vehicle companies are popping up in declining industrial areas trying to get a new industry going. Like what and and Chinese industries are trying to you know the, the, it's now become a political issue with the Chinese uh, uh, often electric car related industries trying to come into this country. And there's an actual debate going on in uh, the halls of Congress right now, which are you know a hellscape of craziness. But there's an actual uh, you know, th 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 those issues that you brought up, we're facing today. Why is that? Like, why why was your book so precious? I I think it's because I just let go of any kind of political, social, cultural uh, biases, and and I also just turned off a part of my mind and said, I want to learn. I want to go. I want to go to 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 Youngstown and learn. I mean, it, it was. I, I I I I wanted to listen and see, and it's amazing what happens when you can let go of your ego. What other things you can see, and I I if the prescience was there, it was um, mostly because no one else was was looking at it, and I it, again I, I I kept thinking that before the book would even be published there'd be all this news reports and everything and my book would be out of date and you know other people would be doing this story and getting fun it didn't happen and that was one of the i i i i remember uh, um talking to someone and saying you know th this shouldn't be the only book like this there should be a dozen factual and another, tw you know, 20 novels like this. Uh, but there weren't. And sometimes our culture moves in inexplicable ways. Right. Is this your most hard boiled novel? Yes. I, I, and, and, and I, I had to choose um, to both honor the realities of Youngstown and Butte and, and, and Allentown and the, the art form that Dashiell Hammett created out of his experiences there. And I, 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 like I say, this was to me in part an homage to Dashiell Hammett. And if, if there was ever a non-sentimental <laughs> novelist, except when he wanted to be it was it was it was hammett and i there were like i i originally wanted to have a happy romantic ending and i thought you know a that probably wouldn't happen in real life and b hammett would hammett would just shake his head in disgust and i wanted i wanted to keep it real and i didn't want to see anything more than it a, a, a nod from Dashiell in the, in the next life, you know. Sure, I don't think it's I don't think it's a secret that this book picks up where Red Harvest left off. I think anyone who has read Hammett or encountered its influence in other films, down to A Fistful of Dollars or Yo Jim, oh. would you know knows that story of um, a secret agent coming into town and manipulating the powers to destroy each other. Oh yeah. Uh, that's kind of like an entry level understanding in a way. And it's just extraordinary to me that that kind of hard boiled story lent its way to a real world analysis of a problem that existed in the present day as you were writing. Yeah, yeah. But I guess that's what happened with Hammett also. Oh yeah, that was, that was uh, you know, shortly after Hammett left um, Butte, the miners union, miners union number one, had to blow up their own union hall 
to get rid of the corruption in the union and and and, and to keep it i mean it just it, it you know it it life is life sometimes is mo more bizarre than any fiction you or i or any of your guests could create or or any of your listeners could imagine you know it's just I guess it's one of the, the the blessings and curses of this life that life is very strange. Yeah. There's a joke in a, a dark joke in Steel Town um, that the residents call Steel Town Steel Town with an A S T E A L. Right. Um, and I have I've heard a story that that was actually meant to be the title of the novel. Absolutely, and that's not what's on the cover. How what happened there? Oh, I, I it, when when I saw those two new stories about Youngstown, I knew immediately that. Um, and I, I remembered Hammett starts up Red Harvest by saying, you know, I first heard Personville called Poisonville in the big sh in in a in a uh, a shop in Butte Montana and I thought I've got to do the same thing I wanted to call my novel Steel Town with an A and I that that was in the proposal I said this is the one thing you you can't do the pub oh yes yes said the publisher and this is I want to I want to turn this to a tale of caution for your listeners and and some advice for them and as i was finishing the book i flew i i was feeling odd physically i was you know getting tremors i was not i was waking up at night with a heartbeat with i had other strange symptoms and my wife simultaneously was going through a hard pregnancy with our son who's thankfully alive and well and you know perfectly healthy um and being the paranoid soul that I am, I decided, well, you know, I must have cancer and be dying, but I don't want to disturb my wife and 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 hurt the, the unborn child. And I also want to make sure that the publisher pays me when I deliver the last third of the commission, which because they hold back. And I went up to New York to get it. And they change executives and, and one of the executives had decided, oh no, let's just call it Steel Town with two E's. Steel Town. And I thought, you know, th th that's not the right A, that's not a great title. And I have a great uh, with an A S T E A L T O W N, that tells the reader what they're in for, you know, and that oh, grabs absolutely. it grabs your eye on the shelf. And I'm listening to the argument from the publishing executive, and I thought, you know, it's one time I have to sacrifice my art for my family because I want them not to. I I, I was afraid they'd decline to publish the book and to pay me what they owed me. I said, okay, you can call it Steel Town. I go back to Washington D.C. defeated, but glad that I'm bringing a check with me. And my wife had arranged for our family doctor to call me. And he said, oh, yeah, it sounds like you got a little thyroid thing called, you know, hyperactive thyroid, maybe Graves disease. Come on in. We'll do a blood test. Sure enough, that's what I had. We played chemistry for my body for six months and I was fine. I could, <laughs> you know, so my caution to, to, to your listeners is this. If, if you're feeling wrong, if you're feeling bad, if you're feeling off, but there's some reason why you don't want to deal with it, forget that. Deal with your physical, mental, emotional health right away, and then take care of the other issue. You right, know? because it, that situation allowed you to get sidetracked. When uh, Steel Town is a very, it's an excellent title for a crime novel, and it mm -hmm. identifies to a reader this is a crime novel, you know. Steel exactly. Is presented here. I'm holding up it up for but for people who can't see the cover, it's a it's a great cover. Um, and 
in the upper right corner, there are people, there's someone with a shotgun, they could be identified as strike breakers, they could be identified as mob thugs, but it could easily be a drama or yeah. something. Yeah. Whereas this is very obviously a crime novel. Right. I and and I I you, you know it's it's and every one of your listeners has had this experience too. When the powers that be in in charge of what you're doing are not seeing the logical reality of, of what you're telling them because they're distracted because they, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And you can't, you can't force it for some reason or another. Uh, I wish I could go back in time and say, uh, it's going to be the title I want or I'll pull it. And I think they would have said, Oh, okay. You know, but I did, you know, <laughs> it, uh, you learn, you know, you learn, you learn from, you learn from what gets done to you to figure out how, what to do next. Right. I know you're not a person who ever looks backward, only forwards, but if, if a publisher came to you and said, we want to reprint this book, would it carry the title that you originally intended? It would be, it would be titled Steel Town with an A. <laughs> it would be it would be there would no be, you know and i I'd, i would tell that publisher you know pay me a dollar and use the use the the right title and you know distribute it uh like it should have been and, and you know for folks in youngstown and butte and detroit and now parts of texas and uh you know to 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 get to understand, maybe to be a little frightened of, uh, and to be entertained by, because I would I would want the, the the I would want it to be the best it could be, you know. I always I always want I always want to give you the best I got, because you deserve that, you know. If you were going to write a book like this today, who would the bad guys be? I would think they would be on Wall Street, and I would think they would be tied in with, uh, you, you know, the, the the we have more billionaires now by a factor of something like fifty there than than existed a decade ago. It's it's astonishing to me, and it seems. With, with with great wealth comes great power. With great power, almost inevitably, comes good corruption or great corruption. Uh, and I would I would today I would want to talk about the effect of these mega and meta international billionaire uh, organizations in a regular american city i mean I, I i don't want to do the story about them in in manhattan in the power circles i want i want to do stories set in the reality that all of your listeners will recognize and you know they'll like for example i'm writing a lot about my native montana now and i do it in a way that the folks who are living uh, along, uh, you know, the Monong Monongahee River can go, oh, yeah, my family went through something like that, only it was, you know, more urban tinged. And it's, I, 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 I want to write about real people. We have, a, especially in this era where certainly the movie industry has taken, been taken over by superheroes. I, I, we more than ever, we need people telling our stories. Right. And I want to be one of those people. Right. Well, and, you know, uh, one of my last questions about Steel Town is sort of about the ending. And I, without giving too much away, I, I do want to tell listeners that um, this might be a slight spoiler. Okay. So just heads up for people who haven't read the book yet. Um, there's an event that happens um, late in Steel Town 
that um, from, from a contemporary perspective almost reminded me of January 6th in the U.S. Yeah. Capitol. And it it it, exi- it happens in a community which has been very complacent because they're just looking for comfort because they think they have no control. Um, and it sort of explodes into a situation where all of their hunger and frustration and feeling of powerlessness just comes out. And and the description is, be, but the description of the fictional city in Steeltown becomes almost a hellscape. And it's it's so dark that I almost felt it was intentionally borderline satire, not not funny, but but showing um a like a shocking conclusion to the situation that all of the yeah. characters in the book have have been dealing with. Um, and I, I have two questions about that. The first one is um. inside the context of that story, do you really think that that's what it would take to wipe the slate clean in a city like Steeltown? Uh, or is that a warning? I, I, I saw it more as a warning because okay. I, I, there were, there were, there were rivers of reform going through the novel and, mm-hmm. and, and there were, there were good people. I mean, they're trying to do, the right thing but they were ignored and stymied and blocked and part of it was the 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 cynicism of the citizenry mm-hmm. i i i i think sometimes that our woes get to be so bad that um you know we called it the american revolution it was it was it was an attempt to change things from the ground level. I don't think we are there as a country. I don't think we're close. I think that um, we still have a tradition and a existing structure that allows us as citizens to try to make things better. But in Steeltown, the novel, that all the forces that in part had been triggered by our hero, Jackson Kane. Right. You know, he, he was he was trying to destroy the old guard that had, you know, run the, the, the town when he was a teenager, but he was too successful. You know, and that can happen. Uh so that you know, yeah, that's it's a hard it's that's a great question and it was a hard ans- one to answer i hope i did it justice oh, oh absolutely um do you think that the warning that comes with this book um is as loud today because i there there were a couple of lines that stood out to me um some of the righteous characters making observations um one of them was that the middle class is a crumbling block and another was to the effect that power relies on the apathy of the people. And I, I think, think those are still problems today. So is the warning as loud now as it was when the book came out in the late 1980s? I th- I think it's at least as loud, if not maybe a touch uh, louder. I mean, the watching watching the prices of of homes all over the country how does anybody who's middle class or starting out now they you know they got their job they got a good job how are they ever going to afford to have their own house you know it's it's that's that's a, a, a real crisis we're all facing now as the middle class you know as, as we're becoming we're not even in cubicles anymore we're in front of our laptops on the kitchen table of the apartment where we're paying outrageous rent and getting, yeah, okay service. Um, and we're also just, I, I, I see it in, in all walks of life, in all ethnicity groups, there's a kind of a, it's not just apathy. It's like a, a, a kind of pessimism that, you know, Okay, 
what difference does it make if I vote? You know, and that is that is a creeping, dangerous problem that I, I, you know, I, I do what I can now to help with, uh, with in various places. Uh, so steel towns warning. So I, I wish I wish I would say, oh yeah, that was that was a stupid warning I I, I created in that novel. I was, you know, I'm so glad I was wrong. Or a good thing I, the problem solved. <laughs> yeah, I I wish I'd been more wrong. Right. Well, so, I want to talk to you about those you alluded to the stories that you have coming. I have one more question about the ending of okay. Steel. Um, because in addition to the influence of history and in addition to the influence of Red Harvest and in addition to just the news that was out when the book was written as well as now, I, I found one other oblique reference that I'm just curious about, um, which is that in addition to Red Harvest, um, the ending of Steel Town reminds me a little bit of the ending of Day of the Locust by Nathaniel West. Yes. Yes. A, and I will tell you, that was the era shortly after I found and discovered Day of the Locust. And which, you, you, you know, if, if your listeners have not read Day of the Locust, please Go to the library. Go to go to bookstores and and ask them to order a used copy if they have to. Um, it's just an astonishing, and it was written. Oh my God, we were. I'm not sure I was born when it was written. It. I think uh, you're right. I think it, it must be from the late 30s or early 40s. I think it was early. It, it was the. It was that peer that brief period after the depression was easing off but before we got into world war ii mm -hmm. and in the hope of all america it's set in los angeles california you know it's just, <laughs> so the, the 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 impact of of day of the locust was definitely um a factor in me discovering or, or me being taken over by the ending of my novel Steel Town. Okay, yeah, because they're 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 two very powerful examples of what happens when the the frustrations of a community explodes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It. Uh, I hope I hope we never. I hope no other novelist ever has to write a book like those two again. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of which. Um, because you're always looking forward. What are you working on now? What's coming forth? Well, one of the things I I realize is that we are we are sort of about to lose the history of our um, uh, of our greatest American era, which was the you know as we came out of the fifties, we we started to deal with um, r racial desegregation. We started to deal with the fact that 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 people were not being treated right because they were women, you know, we, we we were starting to deal with the idea that, I mean, one of my favorite presidents is Dwight Eisenhower. He wanted every American to be educated as much as possible so we could move into the new era. So what I what I am doing now is a trilogy. Uh, that is essentially the coming of age of both the baby boom generation and America after World War II. The first book, the first novel, is called The Smoke in Our Eyes, and it's coming out this February. So quickly, write it down, all you listeners, The Smoke in Our Eyes, February, James Grady. It's set in 1959, the year the music died, the year that we got our first warning of global warming happened in 1959. I know, isn't that shocking? I'm it just it, it when I discovered that it blew my mind, and it was also in 1959 that we first the sort of first two recognized casualties in the Vietnam War that would then go on to scar our generation and and 
kill 58, more almost 59,000 of our fellow citizens, to say nothing of what happened in Southeast Asia and to the balance of power. All that sort of coalesced in 1959. And it was also the year that rock and roll began to emerge. Uh, so I, the smoke in our eyes, I wanted to go back to my small Montana hometown and fictionalize it. It was uh, the 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 fictional town in in the in the novel is like sixty miles east of the Rockies and thirty miles south of Canada and a million miles uh, away from everywhere else. I mean, it's, how do you tell our young people now that there used to be in many places only four TV channels you could get? Right. Try explaining a phone booth to someone who's under 12. They no longer exist in New York. I don't know about the rest of the country. I haven't um, seen one in at least a decade. Oh, oh, you know, and just the idea that you you would you would not be able to just reach out and 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 call your mother wherever you are. You had to go to a building, either a payphone or your your rotary dial telephone hung on the wall all those things are kind of lost even as 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 what we're beginning to see get lost is is a lot of the the better ideas of america started to be free finally at last after the i mean the depression put us into a deep, a, a terrible deep freeze of, of, of cultural advancements. And then World War II, everybody was of one mind. Came the 1950s, we began to be able to see what we could do as ordinary citizens in this world. And my, I, you know, I deal with uh, the smoke, in, my novel, The Smoke in Our Eyes, deals both with the, the ordinary good citizens and the the same kind of noir crime situations I talked about in Steel Town, with uh, in 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 my quote fictional small Montana town, there's a whorehouse protected by the badges, and the city fathers on the edge of town where the women who are essentially enslaved were brought in for for county health checks twice a week for venereal disease and the and Everybody said, "Oh yeah, it's so good that we have the house for uh, to protect our young girls from the bachelors." Well, it was you know the bachelors of the town were not really the main <clears throat> customers of the bordello, and at the same time on Main Street, a frontier doctor who'd become mayor and kind of rich from a, a farm he had. On the second floor of a, a of a a office building on Main Street, ran an abortion clinic, an illegal abortion clinic that was that was famous and visited by desperate women from Seattle to Chicago, who could take the train there, and it was it was uh, everybody knew, everybody just swept it under the rug. I mean, congratulations to Ohio for bringing again sense into into those situations because i don't want to see any more uh, when when he got old and decrepit i saw a tragedy he 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 created giving an illegal abortion to a woman and i uh, who would not not involved with me at all but i i was on the periphery of it and i don't want any woman or any any man for that uh, matter to have to not be able to have control over their own body and get medical help you know i mean we, aren't we supposed to be a sophisticated country where you know going to the doctor is you know an easy thing it's sadly not but that's one issue that i'm so proud of ohio for um le again leading the Amer leading america you know it was, a, oh, by the way, my wife worked as an investigator for Senator Howard Metzenbaum. So Ohio is really important to to my family in, in many ways. 
Oh, wow. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because um, as a, as a take on a crime novel, I think it's very cool to have something like you're describing acknowledged, which is that the fifties were not an innocent time the way they're remembered and that yes. crime has always been so much more. Oh, and people oh. think you, you have just nailed. It was like you hit the nail on the head. You know, it was, it was like, I, I don't, I, I want us to remember our past accurately so we can kind of look at our present, and, you know, a little bit accurately and maybe foresee our future. I mean, Smoke is the first one of the trilogy. The second one is is the 60s uh, from JFK's assassination to the end of the summer of love when we be, and it, it deals with an astonishing amount of sexual violence against women in my high school that I had no clue about. There were only 400 kids in my high school and I should have, we all should have known what was going on to the to, to too many young women. And then the third trilogy in, in, in uh, third book in the Montana trilogy deals with um, 1970. And that was the Kent State summer. Hmm, what state did that happen in? <laughs> and also, it was the first summer of an Earth Day. And I deal with a, a how we chose not to deal with the environmental issues that we, we were had finally nationally recognized and that, you know, are, are going going forward. I mean, it was after Earth Day was the time it was when the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Right. You know, and and we should have. We should remember things like that. And so I'm hoping with this trilogy that's that starts with the smoke in our eyes to deal with um to, to give the readers a chance to see their own lives and to maybe let their grandchildren see where we all came from. Wow. Well, I'll look forward to that. And well, fe come February. Smoke in our eyes, February 2024. Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I, I, well, you, you know, it, it, it is, it's sort of beyond an honor for me to be able to talk about Steeltown and to be in Youngstown figuratively again, and to be, to be know, to know that I'm being listened to by, by people like me, you know, that, that people, uh, and, and and for them to know that that there are a large group of of American artists and creators who are trying to tell their stories even today. I mean, not just Bruce Springsteen and not just James Grady. And boy, was that a that was a haughty comparison there. But it it you know there are a large number of us who want to tell your stories and make sure that you're heard. Uh, and for you, I mean, Eric, you, you, you're you doing that for, for Youngstown. You're letting me help you do that. And I want to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you to all your listeners too. Well, I appreciate it. I'm sure everyone does. Well, everyone, check out The Smoke in Our Eyes, February 2024. Um, in Youngstown, I encourage you to visit Pop Art Books Culture, the only dedicated used bookstore in Mahoning County. Um, the address, the information for that will be available in the credits. In terms of the podcast, please feel free to listen wherever fine audio podcasts are available. This episode will also be free on my Substack. Uh, the transcript for this episode will be available on my Substack, also free. And of course, uh, episodes will be available eventually on YouTube so that we can include closed captioning. So I encourage you to check out all of those avenues. I encourage you to, as always, check out Pop Arts Books Culture, read books, and read James Grady's books. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. I will. Neighborhood Bookstore was created and hosted by Eric Harper. Visit us at ericharperpresents.substack.com for free episodes, transcripts, and all the latest news. 
You can also find us on YouTube and anywhere fun audio podcasts are published. Today's guest host was Craig Duster, owner and head ne'er-do-well at Pop Art Books Culture. When in Boardman, Ohio, please visit Pop Art Books Culture at 6949 Market Street, Boardman, Ohio, 44512, www.popabcstore.com. This episode was produced by Eliza Osborne and Eric Harper. Executive producer, Julie Cancio Harper. Narration by Adam Fetterman. Thank you for listening. We are glad you're here.